Letter ninety one of Letters from Egypt by Lady Lucy Duff Gordon. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. To Sir Alexander Duff Gordon, Luxor, November twenty first, eighteen sixty six. Dearest Alec, I arrived here on the morning of the eleventh. I am a beast not to have written, but I caught cold after four days, and have really not been well, so forgive me, and I will narrate and not apologize. We came up best pace, as the boat is a flyer now, only fourteen days to Thebes, and to Kenna only eleven. Then we had bad winds, and my men pulled away at the rope, and sang the Rais al Rusa, bridegroom going to his bride, and even Omar went and pulled the rope. We were all very merry, and played practical jokes on a rascal who wanted a pound to guide me to the tombs. We made him run miles, fetch innumerable donkeys, and then laughed at his beard. Such is boatman fun. On arriving at Luxor I had a sharivari of voices, and I knew I was at home, by the shrill pipe of the little children, El Sit, El Sit. Visitors all day, of course, at night comes up another dahabiyah, great commotion, as it had been telegraphed from Cairo, which I knew before I left, and was to be stopped. So I coolly said, O oh, Mustafa, the Indian saint, Wali, is in thine eye, seeing that an Indian is all as one with an Englishman. How did I know there was an Indian and a Wali, etc.? Meanwhile the Wali had a bad thumb, and someone told his slave there was a wonderful English doctress. So in the morning he sent for me, and I went inside the harem. He was very friendly, and made me sit close beside him, told me he was fourth in descent from Abid el Qadir Gilami of Baghdad, but his father settled at Hyderabad, where he has great estates. He said he was a Wali, or saint, and would have it that I was on the path of the Darwishes, gave me medicine for my cough, asked me many questions, and finally gave me five dollars and asked if I wanted more. I thanked him heartily, kissed the money politely, and told him I was not poor enough to want it, and would give it in his name to the poor of Luxor, but that I would never forget that the Indian sheikh had behaved like a brother to an Englishwoman in a strange land. He then spoke in great praise of the laws of the English, and said many more kind things to me, adding again, I tell thee thou art a darwish, and do not forget me. Another Indian from Lahore, I believe the sheikh's tailor, came to see me, an intelligent man, and a Syrian doctor, a manifest scamp. The people here said he was Balawar, rope-dancer. Well, the authorities detained the boat with fair words till orders came from Kenna to let them go up further. Meanwhile the sheikh came out and performed some miracles, which I was not there to see, perfuming people's hands by touching them with his, and taking English sovereigns out of a pocketless jacket, and the doctor told wonders of him. Anyhow, he spent ten pounds in one day here, and he is a regular darwish. He and all the harem were poorly dressed, and wore no ornaments whatever. I hope Saeed Abdurrahman will come down safe again, but no one knows what the government wants of him, or why he is so watched. It is the first time I ever saw an Oriental traveling for pleasure. He had about ten or twelve in the harem, among them his three little girls, and perhaps twenty men outside, Indians and Arabs from Syria, I fancy. Next day I moved into the old house, and found one end in ruins, owing to the high Nile and want of repair. However, there is plenty more safe and comfortable. I settled all accounts with my men, and made an inventory in Arabic, which Sheikh Yusuf wrote for me, which we laughed over hugely. How to express a sauce-boat, a pie-dish, etc., in Arabic was a poser. A genteel effendi, who sat by, at last burst out in uncontrollable amazement. There is no God but God! Is it possible that four or five francs can use all these things to eat, drink, and sleep on a journey? N.B. I fear the francs will think the stock very scanty. Whereupon Master Achmet, with the swagger of one who has seen cities and men, held forth, Oh, Effendim, that is nothing. Our lady is almost like the children of the Arabs. One dish or two, a piece of bread, a few dates, and peace, as we say, there is an end of it. But thou shouldst see the merchants of Escandaria, Alexandria, three tablecloths, forty dishes, to each soul seven plates of all sorts, seven knives and seven forks and seven spoons, large and small, and seven different glasses for wine and beer and water. It is the will of God, replied the effendi, rather put down, but, he added, it must be a dreadful fatigue to them to eat their dinner. 
Then came an impudent merchant who wanted to go down with his bales and five souls in my boat for nothing. But I said, O oh man, she is my property, and I will eat from her of thy money as of the money of the Franks. Whereupon he offered one pound, but was bundled out amid general reproaches for his avarice and want of shame. So all the company set a fatah for the success of the voyage, and Rais Muhammad was extorted to open his eyes, and he should have a tarbush if he did well. Then I went to visit my kind friend the Maun's wife, and tell her all about her charming daughter and grandchildren. I was, of course, an hour in the street salaaming, etc. Sheraftina Belidna, thou hast honored our country on all sides. Blessings come with thee, etc. Everything is cheaper than last year, but there is no money to buy with, and the taxes have grown beyond bearing. As a fellow said, a man can't, we will express it, blow his nose, if you please. The real phrase was less parliamentary, and expressive of something at once ventose and valueless, without a kawas behind him to levy a tax on it. The haporth of onions we buy in the market is taxed on the spot, and the fish which the man catches under my window. I paid a tax on buying charcoal, and another on having it weighed. People are terribly beaten to get next year's taxes out of them, which they have not the money to pay. The Nubian MPs passed the other day in three boats, towed by a steamer, very frightened and sullen. I fell in with some Egyptians on my way, and tried to talk the European style of talk. Now you will help to govern the country, what a fine thing for you, etc. I got such a look of rueful reproach. Laugh not thou at our beards, O Effendim. God's mercy, what words are these? And who is there on the banks of the Nile who can say anything but Hadir, ready, with both hands on the head, and a salam to the ground, even to a mutter, and thou talkest of speaking before Effendina? Art thou mad, Effendim? Of all the vexations, none are more trying than the distinctions which have been inflicted on the unlucky Sheikhs el Belid. In fear and trembling they ate their Effendina's banquet, and sadly paid the bill, and those who have had the Nishan, the order of the Majidi, have had to disperse fees, whereat the Lord Chamberlain's staff's mouths might water, and now the wretched delegates to the European chambers, God save the mark, are going down with their hearts in their shoes. The Nubians say that the divan is to be held in the citadel, and that the road by which the Memluk bays left it is not stopped up, though perhaps it goes underground nowadays. November 27th. The first steamer full of travelers has just arrived, and with it the brother of the ladies, all wanting my saddle. I forbade Mustafa to send for it, but they intimidate the poor old fellow, and he comes and kisses my hand, not to get him into trouble with one old woman, who says she is the relation of a consul and a great lady in her own country. I am what Mrs. Grote called cake enough to concede to Mustafa's fears what I had sworn to refuse henceforth. Last year five women on one steamer all sent for my saddle, besides other things, camp stools, umbrellas, beer, etc., etc. This year I'll bolt the doors when I see a steamer coming. I hear the big people are so angry with the Indian saint, because he treated them like dirt everywhere. One great man went with a mudir to see him, and asked him to sell him a memluk, a young slave boy. The Indian, who had not spoken or saluted, burst forth, Be silent, thou wicked one! Dost thou dare to ask me to sell thee a soul to take it with thee to hell? Fancy the surprise of the distinguished Turk. Never had he heard such language. The story has traveled all up the river, and is, of course, much enjoyed. Last night Sheikh Yusuf gave an entertainment, killed a sheep, and had a reading of the Sirat al rasur chapter on the Prophet. It was the night of the Prophet's great vision, and is a great night in Islam. I was sorry not to be well enough to go. Now that there is no Qadi here, Sheikh Yusuf has lots of business to settle, and he came to me and said, Expound to me the laws of marriage and inheritance of the Christians, that I may do no wrong in the affairs of the cops, for they won't go and be settled by the priest out of the Gospels, and I can't find any laws except about marriage in the Gospels. I set him up with the text of the tribute money, and told him to judge according to his own laws, for that Christians had no laws other than those of the country they lived in. Poor Yusuf was sore perplexed about a divorce case. I refused to expound, and told him all the learned in the law in England had not yet settled which text to follow. Do you remember the German story of the lad who traveled um das Gruseln zur Lernen? Well, I, who never Gruselt before, had a touch of it a few evenings ago. I was sitting here quietly drinking tea, and four or five men were present when a cat came to the door. 
I called, Beasts, Beasts, and offered milk, but Pussy, after looking at us, ran away. Well dost thou, O lady, said a quiet, sensible man, a merchant here, to be kind to the cat, for I dare say he gets little enough at home. His father, poor man, cannot cook for his children every day. And then, in an explanatory tone to the company, that is Ali Nasari's boy Yusuf. It must be Yusuf, because his fellow twin Ismain is with his mule at Negeta. Mere Gruselta, I confess, not but what I have heard things almost as absurd from gentlemen and ladies in Europe, but an extravagance in a kuftan has quite a different effect from one in a tailcoat. What, my butcher's boy who brings the meat, a cat? I gasped. To be sure, and he knows well where to look for a bit of good cookery, you see. All twins go out as cats at night if they go to sleep hungry, and their own bodies lie at home, like dead, meanwhile, but no one must touch them or they would die. When they grow up to ten or twelve, they leave it off. Why, your boy Achmet does it. Oh, Achmet, do you go out as a cat at night? No, said Achmet tranquilly, I am not a twin. My sister's sons do. I inquired if people were not afraid of such cats. No, there is no fear. They only eat a little of the cookery, but if you beat them, they will tell their parents next day, so-and-so beat me in his house last night, and show their bruises. No, they are not a freets. They are Benny Adam, sons of Adam. Only twins do it, and if you give them a sort of onion broth and camel's milk the first thing when they are born, they don't do it at all. Omar professed never to have heard of it, but I am sure he had, only he dreads being laughed at. One of the American missionaries told me something like it, as belonging to the Copts, but it is entirely Egyptian and common to both religions. I asked several Copts who assured me it was true, and told just the same. Is it a remnant of the doctrine of transmigration? However, the notion fully accounts for the horror people feel at the idea of killing a cat. A poor pilgrim from the black country was taken ill yesterday at a village six miles from here. He could speak only a few words of Arabic and begged to be carried to the Ababda. So the Sheikh el Belid put him on a donkey and sent him and his little boy and laid him in Sheikh Hassan's house. He called for Hassan and begged him to take care of the child and to send him to an uncle somewhere in Cairo. Hassan said, Oh, you will get well, inshallah, etc., and take the boy with you. I cannot take him into the grave with me, said the black pilgrim. Well, in the night he died, and the boy went to Hassan's mat and said, O oh, Hassan, my father is dead. So the two sheikhs and several men got up and went and sat with the boy till dawn, because he refused to lie down or to leave his father's corpse. At daybreak he said, Take me now and sell me, and buy a new cloth to dress my father for the tomb. All the Ababda cried when they heard it, and Hassan went and bought the cloth, and some sweet stuff for the boy who remains with him. Such is death on the road in Egypt. I tell it as Hassan's slave told it to me, and somehow we all cried again at the poor little boy rising from his dead father's side to say, Come now, sell me to dress my father for the tomb. These strange black pilgrims always interest me. Many take four years to Mecca and home, and have children born to them on the road, and learn a few words of Arabic. End of letter 91 Read by Sibella Denton All LibriVox files are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org.